Hi everybody, it's Dr. Jordan Capper from Medical Cases Podcast, and today I wanted to talk about a position statement from two of the largest groups of emergency medicine physicians, that's ASEP and the AAEM, American uh, Academy of Emergency Medicine. And this is a really interesting point um, that these two groups came together and made a position statement, what they say I'm reading here directly about the video that Dr. Erickson and Masihi put out. Again, these two groups, ASEP and AAEM, are the two largest groups that represent emergency physicians. Uh, and so let me read from this. Um, These reckless and untested musings do not speak for medical societies and are inconsistent with current science and epidemiology regarding COVID-19. This is direct from the two, again, largest, two largest kind of bodies that represent uh, emergency medicine. They say, as owners of local urgent care clinics, it appears these two individuals are releasing biased, non-peer-reviewed data to advance their personal financial interests without regard for the public's health. I wanna, I'm gonna break down this video and I wanna see if you can kind of get a, a grasp for you know what, why you might feel a little wrong about some of the things they're saying. And then I'm gonna actually go through some comments on YouTube in response to this video um, to kind of show what the general public um, thinks about these two docs. And it's it's quite surprising. So to get into it, and, and I wanna be clear here, do not conflate my attack with these two do on these two doctors and their uh, logic and their video and their bias with my opinion of whether, and remember, it's an opinion. God forbid you have an opinion right now. My opinion of whether the country should be opened. Um, I want to be very clear here. And, and it's tough to say, right? It's sometimes difficult to admit that, hey, maybe you're not an absolute genius that knows every single thing um, about society and you, don't, you aren't the absolute expert. And maybe right now it's tough to say if anyone is an absolute expert on this situation. This is a tough situation. But that being said, my general gut feel as an ER doctor um, with years of experience and with experience treating coronavirus patients, uh, I see them every single day. I have intubated them. I've taken care of coronavirus patients that have died. I've watched them die. And I have years of experience um, and have studied immunology, biochemistry, virology. Um, I've made this my life's work. Interesting little intro there. I'll get into what I just said. But look, I have a gut feel that we should probably be opening the country um, around now, right? This was the original plan, and we wanted to flatten the curve with the ultimate uh, idea being that the area under the curve or the total number of infections wouldn't be greatly infected, uh, greatly affected by social isolation. So the original plan um, a couple months ago was to socially isolate, flatten the curve, reduce the stress on the healthcare system uh, so that we don't get overwhelmed. And that was great. We needed to do that. And the plan was always to, to eventually reopen. So uh, don't, don't get it conflated here that I'm getting into the politics of this whole thing, whether and when we should open or not. It's, it's a shame that this has even gotten to this like political level. But 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 let me go into the video now. I don't want to dive too deep into whether or not we should open this exact second and how we should open because again, um, I'm not a perfect expert on that. Although I don't think anybody can be an absolute expert, right? You have to take your experience. You have to take um, your data and analyze it. God forbid I don't toot my own horn. And so I'm going to start with the intro of this video where these guys do exactly what I did. You'll note that I uh, talked about how I have extensive experience, years of experience with biology, biochemistry. Um, I've studied these things. I've made it my life work. I'm an experienced ER physician. And while this is all true, right, um, but note every word these guys use 
They're absolute experts. And, and I have experience talking in front of a microphone. Um, I've experienced convincing people. I know not to pop my peas, and that's why I have the pop filter. I, I know not to say the word um too many times. These guys are experts. Their delivery is flawless. Um, they are manipulative, and they are professionals. These are very good businessmen. You can tell by the way they interact, by the way they, mm-hmm. Do you think I really needed a stethoscope? No, I don't need a stethoscope for this video. And look at these guys, right? They're both wearing their scrubs um, and they, they both kind of go in and tout all of their experience. They say they have all this experience with biochemistry, immunology. Yeah, so does every single doctor, right? That's, that's medical training, it's rigorous. Um, and so they, every word they use uh, is kind of, kind of manipulative and there's gonna, and if you pay attention, there's one key problem with all their arguments. So let's keep going. Um, they do make some good points and we'll go into those later. But from the very beginning, um, the intro, they talk about their background. They keep repeating the single phrase, and I counted this. They said this, let's see, eight times, millions of cases, small amount of deaths. Millions of cases, small amount of deaths. And this is a tactic, right? This is called argument by repetition. This is a known tactic. You repeat the same thing over and over and over again. Millions of cases, small amount of deaths. And let's see how they get these millions of cases because their data that they use is, it's almost laughably bad. And they, they gotta know it. These guys gotta know that what they're doing is just horrible. Um, the way they're extrapolating their data, they make an appeal to the data, right? An appeal to like an authority. We're just looking at the data here. No, you're not. You're extrapolating horribly. So what do they do? Well, what's their entire argument? In their intro, first they give their whole background on how they're so smart and they have all these, um, all these classes they've studied. They make it their life worth work. And then he says, we tested at their urgent cares. We tested 5,213 people, and we have 340 positive. That makes 6.5%. Okay, so 6.5% of their tests are positive. Then you can extrapolate from that, since they're in California, that if 6.5% of people tested are positive, then 6.5% of the population of California, that is 4.7 million people in California have coronavirus. Um, that being said, there's at the time of their video 1,227 deaths in California. So only about 1,200 have died in California out of 4.7 million cases. That means um, there's only a 0.03% chance, 0.03% chance of death from COVID in California. Okay, what's wrong here? What exactly is the issue? Well, this is the key. They go over this over and over and over again. And, and this is this is like studying data 101, right? They even use that with, with immunology. They say, this is immunology 101. Every word they say is manipulative, right? It's like, oh, anybody would know this. This is immunology 101, Psh, of course, right? So I kind of did the same thing. But, but you get my point. This is very basic. Uh, when you start to learn how to analyze uh, a, a, an article. And this is something we are trained um, on in med school and residency. We read dozens of articles, uh, dozens. We read thousands of articles and we learn how to analyze them to say, hmm, is there something wrong with the way they interpreted this or how they gathered data? And the way these guys gathered data is, is <laughs> it's just a joke. So what's the problem? sampling bias, okay? They said we have, they tested about 5,000 people and 340 were positive. That is 6.5%. But they didn't test a random sample. They tested people that came to their clinics. So that would be like if you went to a dermatologist and the dermatologist does samples of skin, 
biopsies of skin, right? He sees a little mole, he does a sample, and maybe, uh, I don't know what the number would exactly be, 5% of the samples come back as cancer that the dermatologist says. Well, then you could extrapolate and say that 5% of the population, if you sampled their skin, have skin cancer. What? What? Or if you go into the ER and 10% of people have strokes in the ER, oh yes, 10% of my patients had strokes. That means 10% of the population is having a stroke. That's sampling bias. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And so he takes this point, this horrible, horrible case of sampling bias, where he says 6.5% of the population has coronavirus just because 6.5% of the patients he tested have coronavirus. You can't do that. And then he extrapolates all the way out. He takes that, that one thing and he just runs with it the entire time. He uh, then goes in to say that, okay, in New York City, he says 39% of New Yorkers tested positive for coronavirus. And he's using that exact same thing He's using the sampling bias. He's taking the numbers of the people uh, tested and which percent were positive. And he's saying, well, then you can extrapolate and say 39% of people in New York state have coronavirus. You can't do that. It's just insane. And he's gotta know this. Um, and he goes again, and then he talks about Spain. 22% of the tests were positive in Spain. Therefore, 22% of the population in Spain is positive. <sighs> You can't do it. It makes no sense. You can't go into the ER and see that one out of the 10 people have a stroke and say, well, one out of 10 of the population are having a stroke right now. It's not how it works, right? It's sampling biased. Unless you're testing random people, which we are in, in America, there's some trials testing random people, but unless you're testing random people, you can't say the exact prevalence uh, or how many people in society have the disease. So he takes this and he just goes. So that's the intro. The intro is just this horrible case of sampling bias. And then he continues. And watch the video, right? You can tell from the reporters, they feel something wrong. Their, their questions are like, oh, what? You're like, wait, these guys are kind of saying facts. But unless you're trained in analyzing data, it doesn't like jump at you. It sounds good when they say it. And again, these guys are highly, highly skilled. They know what they're doing. They know how to talk. They know how to respond to questions. These are, these are experienced um, businessmen. And this is, to take it a step further, this is what's wrong with a lot of medicine, a lot of media, and a lot of politics. People who know how to manipulate people who know how to argue in a very effective way. Uh, next, they go into Sweden versus Norway. They try to compare a lockdown versus a non-lockdown country. Um, no isolation versus isolation. Um, he says uh, massive number of cases, small number of deaths twice in this section. Again, he repeats it eight times throughout, um, throughout this uh, video and he talks about the total number of deaths which in Norway were 206 as of today I just looked this up Norway has 206 Sweden has 2355 he says well those are about the same those, there's no statistical difference and it's like okay all right 200 and 2300 202,000 are statistically insignificant so okay he must just be doing some goofy statistics there to call that, whatever, that's just not even true. So move on. The Sweden-Norway section is just, again, insanely manipulative. Then he starts to go into child molestation. This is called an appeal to emotion. He says children are getting molested because of the lockdown. Okay, People are staying at home, right? There's data to say that spousal abuse is, is increasing um, and maybe child molestation is increasing. These are horrible things, right? They, of course, these are bad, um, it, but it's the way he uses this, right? Every point he brings up is something that sticks in your mind. 
And that's something that sticks with you, right? Wow, children are getting molested from the lockdown. And these are guys that have a massive financial interest in opening up their clinics. Their volumes are way down. Their urgent care clinics volumes are down because of the coronavirus. They want to open up the country again. And he uses child molestation as a arguing tool, as an appeal to emotion. And he talks about the list, right? Look at the way they talk. Alcoholism, depression, suicide, spousal abuse, child abuse. They list these things and and it affects you, right? And, and if you read through these comments on YouTube, um, it affects people. It, these forms and these ways of arguing are, are effective. It's called an appeal to emotion. Um, it's a type of informal uh, logical fallacy or an argumentation technique that is not uh, good or is not inherently sound. So he uses child molestation uh, as an appeal to authority. Again, come on. Like, of course, this is a bad thing. And, and I can already see what every bottle would say. Oh, so you don't care about child molestation? Oh, come on. You know, of course, that's a bad thing. No one's saying it's not. Like, just talk like a normal human and don't manipulate. It's so manipulative. Unbelievable. All right. Next section, he goes into the flu virus. So he talks about the lethality of COVID-19 is less than the flu virus. Oh my. Okay. So all of our, our data is saying that the mortality is anywhere from it could be from one to seven percent, one to some some say nine percent. It's it's not nine percent, but let's say one to seven. Uh, the flu lethality is about point one around the point one zone. And look, you're never going to get perfect data for any of this. We every doctor that has any experience that knows how data is gathered. And that's pretty much every doctor that's not lying or manipulating, we know that data is not perfect. And so he, bring, he actually brings up some good points. He says, in medicine, you have to make decisions with limited data. This is a key aspect of being a doctor. You look at all the available data, all the available studies, you grill those studies, you understand uh, how they gathered the data, how they did the statistics, and then you come to a conclusion all the while, knowing that, knowing you could say almost the percentage or the gut feel of, okay, I am practicing this way, what are the chances that I'm actually right? And until the next big study comes out, um, you, you don't know always 100%. My one favorite example was um, there's an article that came out a couple years ago talking about giving platelets. Um, these can help your blood clot platelets in people with bleeding in the brain who are taking aspirin. So, okay, aspirin's a blood thinner and um, it should, you know, it should make bleeding worse in the brain. It does. Um, but then give platelets to platelets actually can kind of reverse the aspirin. So it would make sense, right? You're bleeding in the brain, give some platelets, uh, and it helps kind of reverse that aspirin effectively. And you'd think it would help. Well, um, it turns out that actually increases mortality. The logic is not sound. Medicine isn't always perfectly logical. Sometimes it takes a study. Um, and of course you can theorize on the exact mechanism behind that increase in mortality. The point is, simple logic doesn't always work in medicine. You need the data, and we know that. I, I wasn't surprised when that article came out um, because we know how complex medicine is, and it's not always this simple answer. Um, so we are used to knowing that we don't have all the data, and this guy actually brings that up, which I really like, um, but what he then does is he takes this very valid point of, in medicine, we're used to operating with limited data or the best data possible, and then he just goes off. Um, he, 
he says that the flu deaths are anywhere from 25,000 to 60,000 per year. And this is true. Um, a lot of people die from flu every year. So um, a 0.13% chance of death. And then he says Corona is only 0.02%. Oh, what? Um, how does he do that? Well, he basically, he, he does his extraction thing again, where he takes the percentage of people that, so, you know, I'm, I'm like having trouble thinking how he does it because it's like, it's gymnastics. So he takes the percentage of people tested for Corona and the percentage of people that were positive. Um, this is our sample bias again, because we're not just testing random people. We're testing in the beginning and even now, most people getting tested are people that are symptomatic or we have at least some suspicion of corona. We are not doing mass random testing for most patients. Most patients being tested right now are suspected to some degree to have corona. So you would expect that the people we're testing now have a much higher percentage of, inf of positive test results than the general population. That is that is absolutely true. Um, but he does the same thing again, where he takes the percentage of people being tested and what percentage of those are positive. And then he says, okay, let's multiply that by the entire population of the United States. So we have whatever millions and millions of cases, which is he gives the wrong number. And he says the prevalence is massive of coronavirus in the US and then he multiplies that by the lethality. Um, let's look at some real numbers, okay? <laughs> the lethality of corona is not 0.02%. It is way, way higher. It's probably uh, on the degree of, let's say the flu is about 0.1% uh, lethal. If corona is 1%, that's 10 times deadlier than the flu. You know, we got some of the the data is saying that it could be up to like 5%. That's 50 times deadlier than the flu. Either way, coronavirus is significantly deadlier than the flu. That, that, I mean, that's it. Like, they're just... I'm speechless here, right? It is definitely deadlier than the flu based on all of the data that we have right now. And there's like the the gut check factor. <laughs> I see the coronavirus patients. New York City is getting slammed. The point of, we know the point of social isolation, right? It was to flatten the curve, to reduce the uh, strain on the healthcare system. And that's why we did it, right? And, and don't, again, don't get my um, attack on these guys conflated with my opinion on and notice I say opinion, my opinion on whether the economy should open back up or society should open back up. Um, I am definitely attacking these, the argument of these guys directly. But I think in general, you know, use a little sense here. Jeez, we said from the beginning, we're going to do social isolation. We're going to flatten the curve so that we don't hit the healthcare capacity. That was the point of isolation. And so all these hospitals throughout the country, I hope, shame on you if you haven't been getting prepared. Um, we've spent this time preparing. I mean, insane amounts of work have gone into preparing over these past two months. Um, so yeah, that was a point of social isolation. It was never the plan to stay isolated forever. Um, in general, yeah, we should be starting to open up at some point soon. You can't keep the economy closed down forever. You can't have the economy shut down for two years. Um, I don't think anybody's even saying that, right? Uh, so in general, I would kind of agree with the with the core point of like, you know, we should start to open back up. That's, that's okay. And I don't think anybody's even saying not to open back up at some point. It's like this thing gets has gotten so politicized. Where did this... Where did this even come from? This like duality. Oh, we got to stay closed forever. No one's saying that. It's just the the media um, creating this artificial duality. So to get back on 
on what I was saying. I don't necessarily think we should, no one thinks we should stay closed down forever. But these guys, the way they're doing it, they are absolutely manipulative. And if you look at this ASAP and AAEM statement, this is something you don't always see. <laughs> these big bodies, which are political in themselves too, don't get me wrong here. These big bodies coming out um, and saying they explicitly condone what these guys are saying. Ooh, come on, man. And you got to understand when you're being manipulated. And it's so interesting to see the amount of manipulation in, in a lot of people, a real lot of people that are talking. I'm sure some are just misinformed, um, but a lot are really, really manipulative in the media. And a lot of people have secondary motivations. Um, so he goes through the Sweden, Norway. He does the appeal to emotion with the child molestation. He completely erroneously says that the flu virus is more lethal than the corona. Okay, let's look at some basic numbers here. This is from me doing the most basic of research by just checking the facts. In the U.S. right now, 56,900 deaths. So about 60,000 deaths in the United States. Over 50,000 of those are from April alone. 50,000 deaths in one month. Okay, the flu virus kills 20 to 60,000 per year, per year. And in one month, 50,000 people, over 50,000 people have died in the United States. All right, that's with social isolation. We've been isolated pretty well in a lot of parts of the country. So with social isolation, 50,000 people died in one month. I remember in the very beginning, when we started social isolation, um, there was kind of this this meme or this saying going around that if we do this right, we'll look back and say, geez, we didn't even need to social isolate. This wasn't that bad. That was the point of social isolation was to make it not as bad. And yes, when we open back up, there'll probably be a spike. We're But we're getting more prepared. Geez, at least we have enough masks uh, in most places. That's not even to get into the issue that some hospitals are are mask shaming and, and they're telling their staff not to wear masks, probably to save money. That's an entire different issue. Point is, the, the systems, the healthcare systems that care about their workers, that care about their patients, not just profits, which, again, the, the problem with this video is, is corporate medicine. It's putting money over patients and over your, your workers. And as an individual, here now I'll start the preaching, right? As an individual, you need to recognize this and you need to see it in yourself. You don't have to. <laughs> Capitalism does not necessarily equate with being brutally selfish and like almost evil. You can run an ethical company there's many examples. It has been done. It is being done. You can run a company that does good for people. You don't have to spew disinformation and lies to further your cause. You can run a good company that provides good products and services to people without bending your morals. So rant over. Let's get back to breaking down this article. The flu virus thing. 50,000 people have died with social isolation in April. Okay, clearly it's more lethal than the flu. What percent? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? You know, we can't estimate exactly uh, what it is. I will say also in this, this uh, video, these guys bring up the point, which is, again, kind of this weird appeal to emotion where they say, 96 or, or some number like that, 94, 96% of the people dying of this have comorbidities. Okay, about a third of the people in the United States have hypertension. That's considered a comorbidity. Um, any disease, based on the fact that what these guys are doing, if you have any disease in, in your chart, they're considering that a comorbidity to get this like 96%. So, 
again, just kind of manipulative, right? Like, oh, only only people with real serious medical problems are are dying from this. But no, no, man, like hypertension is not that severe of a thing. <laughs> I don't want my brother who's 29 years old and has hypertension, even though he's a cross country runner, he just has hypertension. I don't want him to be written off that he could have just died from this corona. Oh, that kid had hypertension. He was gonna die from it. Like, no, just no, stop it, stop it, bad. <sighs> All right, so that's the numbers, the flu virus thing. Okay, next section. It's like this never ends, right? They just keep talking forever to point by point. I know, energy drinks. So then they talk about the immune system. Oh my. <laughs> they drop their, their stats, or their stats? They drop their like requisites again. We've studied extensively virology, immunology, biochemistry. Dude, you want me to, to conflate my stats? Like, look, I'm an ER doctor. I am highly trained. I have done over 30,000 hours of training. Let's see, four, eight, seven, how many years have I done? 11, 12 years of training. I mean, American doctors are highly trained. It doesn't mean you have to like kind of BS it, right? They say, we have extensive training over 40 years of experience. We have a training in virology, immunology. Um, we've made this our life's work. Okay, dude, I don't think your life's work is meant to be an immunologist. You, you, we all took courses in med school and we're all really smart and we know virology and immunology, but you don't have to kind of like manipulate it to make it seem like you're some immunologist. Come on, man, just, just come on. All right, so that's the immune system intro. Then, oh, they get into what is just, just fall, just, again, speechless. They say, we're not wearing masks because we want to have a good immune system. That's basic immunology. So they, they talk about how the immune system works and they give, again, like spewing these, like, Kind of big words, you know, you can use big words to sound smart. Instead of saying DNA, he says de deoxyribonucleic acid. Oh man, I know deoxyribonucleic acid as well, okay? I know how to say it too. Then they talk about how the immune system works. They talk about antigen antibody, and then you form IgG and IgM when you're exposed to viruses and bacteria. Oh, boom, I just did it too. Nice. I know how basic immunology works as well. And to explain kind of what they're getting at is the very short version of the immune system is that you get exposed to, it's called an antigen. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to like use the words to sound smart here. You get exposed to an antigen, which is whatever, bacteria, virus, some sort of particle that is attacking the body. It doesn't always have to attack either, by the way. You get exposed to an antigen. Your body sees it. Your body has an called an antibody and it's like oh okay all right I see this thing I recognize this thing and it forms little you could call them almost memory molecules um, where it, the IgM and IgG and those little memory molecules remember that you saw this antigen the IgM and IgG remember that you saw this particular type of virus this particular type of um, agent that is insulting to the body that's how vaccines work. You get exposed to the virus or bacteria uh, in a state that's either completely killed or no longer dangerous to you. And then your body sees it and it remembers it so that the next time you see that bacteria or virus, it crushes it. That's how the immune system works. They give a nice little intro. Hopefully I did as well. I'm rolling my eyes too much during this video, I know. So. They give a nice little intro to the immune system. I like it. And then they talk about 
babies and coming out of the womb and how they put viruses in their mouth and that's how they build their immune system okay get getting getting decent there a little manipulative you know kind of talking to us like we're we're a child <laughs> giving the little baby example um they say this is microbiology 101 Psh, of course you should know this again manipulative statements then they, they make their final big like appeal which is what you stay at home decreases your immune system. Wearing a mask decreases the immune system because you're not exposed to the antigens. Okay, that's just not true at all. Um, it's just not true. That basically, they equate wipe. They talk about you're going to wipe all all your counters, wipe all your counters down, and you're not going to get exposed to antigens. Let me let me state that very clearly. Cleaning your counters drops, that's the word they use, drops. Cleaning your counters drops your immune system, is their logic. The whole point of me making this video is to, hopefully, if you listen to these guys and you liked what they said, I want you to kind of understand you, you were manipulated. And it's hard to recognize. It causes internal, it causes what's called cognitive dissonance. It makes you feel bad. It makes you think, geez, I was manipulated. And, and what's the natural response? To look at me, right? Who's this guy? Who's he getting paid by? Why does he want to keep the country closed down? Okay, I just addressed that in the video. My gut says we should probably start to slowly open. So there goes your argument. My whole point of this video is to highlight the different ways that you are manipulated throughout the day with people, by people who have an agenda. And these guys clearly have an agenda, and so do a lot of other people in the media. Um, yeah, this is very manipulative. So they say cleaning your counters drops your immune system. You're not exposed. You're not out in the community getting exposed to all the antigens. That's just, it's insane. There's plenty of antigens in your house. There's plenty of antigens all over your body. There's all kinds of viruses. Staying in your house, socially isolating, does not drop your immune system. I mean, staying at home, eating a bunch of Cheetos, not getting exercise, yeah, that's not good for you. Um, again, no one's saying to stay closed forever. At this point in the video, then they kind of start to get attacked. Uh, I have these broken up into sections. I call it the attack. The the reporters start to sense, hey, something's like not something's not right here with what these guys are saying, um, and they start to to ask questions, um, and that's when these guys really show their skills um, at dealing with questions. They show their skills at being businessmen and. and don't get, get me wrong, I'm an entrepreneur myself. Um, and that's why I see these tactics in these guys. They The reporters are kind of like, man, what, like they start asking questions about their numbers and how they're interpreting data. And they give more examples um, about how they know better than um, than Fauci or you know the, the other um, people that are making recommendations. They say, well, this is the difference between a general contractor and a subcontractor. You know, we're like the subcontractors out there doing it. We're in the field seeing these patients. The other the other people in their ivory towers, they haven't seen patients in 20 years. Okay, great. Belittle, use an easy example to understand. Dr. Uh, Dr. M, what is this guy's name? Masihi, he does the classic. Hey, what's your what's your first name? Oh, yeah, John. I forget what the guy's name is. Oh, yeah, John. He, he that's like, it's, it's, I could almost see it in like, like an episode of some comedy show, like the classic corporate guy, like, yeah, use the first name, you know, you know, you've you seen this before, right? You use somebody's name and it sticks. It's like a power move, classic power move from this guy. Yeah, what's your first name? Oh yeah, John, okay. Um, solid power move, by the way, Dr. Masihi, real nice. Um, so where were we? Oh, they keep getting attacked. Um, then they start talking about, um, Fomites, which again, big word, solid work. Way to use a big word. I can use it too. Um, 
fomites, which are just anything, you know, fomite and anything, any object is, is a fomite. And basically, you know, I touch this and then my, this is slow. <laughs> I, I touch this and then my baby touches it and then he gets the, the virus or whatever. That's a fomite, something that can carry uh, the virus or bacteria or whatever. Um, that's called a fomite. And so they talk about fomites and then they say, Okay, so that's a good concept. Maybe you learned what a fomite is. Oh, wow, I'm learning. Then they say, well, you're not allowed to go to church or to work, but you can go to Costco and touch their um, water bottles or Home Depot and get their shovels. And you think those fomites don't have stuff? You don't think the Costco guy is coughing on, <clears throat> on the water bottles? Okay, yes, the Costco guy could cough on the water bottles, but... Um, you know, it, it, that's the whole point of essential versus non-essential workers. Uh, that was why we made essential workers. If you don't have an essential job, yeah, we closed down the country. That's what we did to stop this from turning into an absolute bloodbath in our country. We shut down non-essential jobs. That, that was the point, right? And then, I like this. They make it, I don't know if this is conscious or unconscious, but they say there's inconsistency there, right? You can get fomites from Costco and Home Depot, but you don't see them close. But they are closing down your work and church. I swear. It, that's like a perfect appeal to, to the religious minded. And whether or not you think churches should be shut down, I think you could make a, an argument either way. It's like we need spiritual guidance during these, these horrible times. God knows I can use a couple prayers, um, but not the point, whether you, you want to shut down churches or not. They appeal to, to the working class and they then they appeal to the religious. It's like, boom, boom, solid work, man. These guys are good, uh, good manipulators. Ah, all right, so we're still going. It's like, it's nonstop. They say from a microbiological immuno from a microbiological immunological standpoint, that doesn't make sense, was his response or was his comment on this whole fomite thing. Like, nice job, man. From a microbiological immuno I can't even say it right. He, like he just hits it. You impressive manipulators. Uh come on, man. Okay. And he goes back again to the mask thing. We're not wearing masks because wearing masks decreases your immune system. That's just basic immunology. Whew. Okay. Then they keep going. I'm like getting fatigued here with this. Then they keep going. These people that they talk about the autopsies. Oh, this is the other issue. Jeez, they hit every single thing. They really do. Then they talk about doctors being pressured to add COVID to the diagnosis. But in no way, let me just be absolutely clear. In no way have I even felt, and I, I think I have a pretty good understanding of um, kind of the business behind medicine, behind the pressures from, from administration. Look, corporate, my whole point of this is that you can be manipulated um, and corporate medicine isn't necessarily a good thing. Some of these really big for-profit hospital networks, they don't have your best interest in mind. Like, let me be clear here. They don't. But I'm not getting manipulated to add COVID when it's to the de cause of death, when it didn't cause the death. I These guys didn't say it, but I heard somebody say, yeah, patients will come in, get a gunshot wound, die from getting shot, and then the doctors and they test COVID positive, and then the doctors encouraged to put COVID as cause of death. No, just no. That's it. I don't even have a more of an argument. It's just straight up no. That's not. I'm not. I do the cause of death. This is firsthand. I'm the guy. When somebody gets shot, and they get and they're COVID positive, I don't put cause of death COVID. It's just not true. Um. And so these guys kind of go into that conspiracy about how doctors are being pressured to increase numbers and make it worse from it is, but make it worse than it is. Okay, no, 
first of all. And then second of all, they go into the COPD thing. They say, well, this patient had COPD and they died from pneumonia and respiratory distress, like failure to breathe. And it was from the COPD, not the COVID. That's, that's kind of mixing logic. There's a real big issue with that statement. And I've heard this multiple times. Let me try to break this down. I've heard the statement, well, patients, this patient had a history of heart disease in COPD, and then they died, and they were COVID positive. So they didn't die from COVID, they died from their 20 years of smoking and COPD and heart disease. All right, this, this gets complex, but basically, yes, if they hadn't smoked for 20 years and they didn't have heart disease, then their chances of dying from coronavirus would be less. But that can go with anything, right? Say you get a kidney infection, a severe UTI, it's called pyelonephritis. Say you get shot, let's take that example, right? Having COPD and heart disease does not help your mortality when you get shot. Let's say, you know, you take a bunch of people and they all get shot. A young, healthy person can survive a gunshot wound better than um, than somebody that's 75 with heart disease. So, so it's, and, and that is something that you can intuit easily, right? No one would say, well, it was the heart disease and the COPD that killed the patient, not the gunshot wound. It, it's just, it's, it's mixing the points around. It, it's, it's dishonest is what it is. All right, so, so that's the deal with the immune system, uh, or, sorry, with the autopsies thing. Um, it, it's just, yeah, it's just completely mixing, just mixing stuff around. Um, yeah, if you have COPD and MI and you get shot, your chances of dying are higher than if you're young and healthy. Sure, but you still died from a gunshot wound. And, and these guys, I keep hearing this point. It's just not, it's not right. Then they get into another issue. They talk about furloughing doctors and staff. They say we have doctors and nurses getting furloughed and there's gonna be a spike uh, in cases after things open up and then we're gonna have hospitals that are poorly staffed. And well, that's it's actually a, a good issue, a good point. Um, but we can, we can increase that staffing very quickly though. And this, this has been a very stressful time for a lot of people in medicine, uh, doctors, nurses, getting pay cuts. A lot of people aren't, don't really know, know this, but yeah, doctors and nurses are getting pay cuts. We are being furloughed um, and it's not good. You're on the front lines, you're getting a pay cut. Yeah, but, but volumes are down. Um, and so, yeah, you, you could probably say that I have a similar um, motivation is these guys, right? Like I'm financially incentivized to open society back up so that our hospital can start doing, uh, can start making money again by seeing patients um, so that I don't get furloughed. But, but you don't see me doing that. You, you see me being honest and like trying to break down the information here. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, the long and short point by point. One more thing I wanted to do was go through some of their quotes and just look at the manipulation behind it. So they say, we have never seen where we quarantine the healthy. And this is, again, they repeat this multiple times. We've never seen it where we quarantine the healthy. Yeah, well, you've never seen a global pandemic in your lifetime on this scale. All right? Just come on. When I talk to ER physicians around the country, okay, I'm an ER physician, you didn't talk to me. And again, that's the classical appeal to authority. Um, they say initial models were woefully inaccurate. And just, they're so good at, listen to that sentence, right? Initial models were woefully inaccurate. Well, they were inaccurate in the fact that we did social isolation and they were the very beginning models. This thing is serious. No one's saying it's not. Well, it's up for you guys. Um, and you don't have to say 
You don't have to completely manipulate and say this disease ca causes less deaths or is less virulent than uh, the flu to say, hey, the country should probably open back up at some point soon. Like that's, that's you can make a lot of really coherent arguments as to why the country should open back up, including the fact that we always planned on opening it back up. You don't have to go into this whole spiel. Um, they say viruses, bacteria, IgM, IgG, basic immunology. It, the way they kind of machine-like rip off medical terms is they do it multiple times. Um, they talk about, we've never responded like this. Why are we doing it now? Again, these kind of vague questions that, that make people think like, hmm, oh yeah, why are we doing it now? What's going on here? Look, you don't have to dig deep into a conspiracy theory to know, into conspiracy theories to know the government doesn't always have your best interests in mind and plenty of politicians are corrupt. You know, it's like, you don't have to play, play this game and manipulate people. Jeez. And I want to be clear. This is, I'm breaking down this video because these guys, it was so blatant and so obvious. This is, these type of tactics are throughout the entire media. And it's really tough as a consumer, um, or, uh, just a regular person, not necessarily just a consumer, but uh, I guess a consumer of media to know what's true um, and what's not. And maybe, not maybe, most likely, I, I feel that the amount of disinformation that I've seen in the past month has skyrocketed. But maybe it's really not skyrocketed. Maybe it's just that I'm a doctor and now I know that it's not true. Is I think Michael Crichton talks about this. He he talks about the gel man amnesia effect. Basically, like you're an expert on a topic, just like I'm an expert on medicine, and I see an article or a piece of publication on medicine, and I'm like, oh, okay, that is just completely off base, right? And that's the feel that I've got for a lot of these media stories. Um, they're just off base. It's not like a full lie, which, you know, it's, these guys are almost a bad example of that. They just say some straight up wrong stuff. Um, but it's like their arguments are just off base in some kind of way. And I see something off base and I'm like, oh, geez, yeah, media again, not getting stuff right. Uh, and then I turn the page and I read about politics or the environment or the economy. And I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I believe this. But, and I completely forget the fact that just one page before the arguments made were completely off base. And this is this Gell-Mann, I think it's called the Gell-Mann amnesia effect, where you're an expert on something, you know that the media article you read is just completely wrong, not necessarily fully factually wrong, but just reversed is cause and effect, or it's just not really a main issue. It's not one of the key issues going on. And then you turn the page and you completely forget about all of that. So I just want to make you aware of these things going on. It's probably going on every day that you interact with the media. Um, and then the last thing, uh, the last quote that got me again, do you want your immune system built or not? All I can do, it's not even, a, it's not a good way to address arguments. Rolling your eyes is not a good way to address arguments. I get it. I'm an adult. I'm a doctor. I'm not supposed to just roll my eyes in a YouTube video. It, it's all I can do. Speechless. Uh, they do say some some completely wrong stuff as well. Nobody does corona testing in-house. They say that uh, not true. Uh, we do coronavirus testing. I can get the test back at my hospital within hours. That's pretty good. Uh, they say this virus will mutate and get better. And the string of logic he uses is um, he kind of uses like this selection type evolution concept where he says... Um, 
people that die from the virus are less likely to pass on their virus because they're dead. And people that are asymptomatic carriers are going to be out in the community and they're going to be spreading the virus more because they're asymptomatic and they're out walking around. Okay, that, that's, that's, that is inherently sound, but it's not necessarily a fact. Um, that's not how things always work. This could easily mutate and get worse or it could easily mutate and get better, or it could stay the same. You, you just can't make statements, this will mutate and get better. No, can't make that statement. Um, look, these guys are pros. Don't let the Gell-Mann amnesia effect affect you. Take my breakdown of their argumentation tactics and look for it in other places and you'll see it. You'll see it all over. Um, yeah, it's really, it's something that I've seen every day in the media, by politicians, um, by news, news corporations. And a lot of times I don't even really fully know the motivations. Um, I suspect each person has their own. Sometimes it is pressure to make money. Sometimes it's you want to make a good story. Um, sometimes it's you really believe what you believe, you know, uh, the hydroxychloroquine thing. This was a big issue. Uh, I, maybe it is still a big issue, but I saw this a lot more in the media talking about how hydroxychloroquine is a cure and they are trying to, what do they say? Hydroxychloroquine is a cure. They're trying to bury it because they want the virus to grow. And I started seeing these arguments and kind of started to see it in the media where reporters would try to like, uh, I saw one with Fauci and, and uh, a news reporter and they were kind of trying to like corner him into this line of logic. And, and all he was saying was like, uh, he even explicitly stated, we're not forcing people not to take hydroxychloroquine, just that more data should probably be had before we make a sweeping generalization that this fairly dangerous medication uh, should be given to everybody with coronavirus. Like, that's just simple. Nobody would, uh, nobody would disagree with that. Let's be safe here and not make a sweeping generalization that a possibly cardiotoxic medication should just be given out like candy. Um, it, it, there's never a conspiracy on it. And I'm going to do an appeal to authority here. Listen to how I talk too. I do it sometimes, but you know, I don't think it's in a dishonest way, but talk to any doc, ask them about the hydroxychloroquine and ask them their gut feel. We know viruses are, uh, are typically very hard to treat. And we all kind of had the same general feel about hydroxychloroquine in the beginning. And a lot of the treatments, yeah, maybe it has some effect. It, there's obviously risks to using a medication. And um, we were a lot of doctors, and you look at a lot of the protocols, hospitals were and still are using this medication um, on the chance that it works. We don't have good data to say whether it does or doesn't. It's definitely not as effective as like an antibiotic in a kidney infection or an antibiotic in a pneumonia, if there is an effect from hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin, it's probably a small degree of an effect. Um, yeah, that's that's not an exciting statement, right? If there is an effect, it's it's probably small, and we need to do it in select patients. It doesn't make for good news. It's not a great argument that you can break down and go one side versus the other. It's not a headline. So, you know, as you move forward, think about, think about how you can get manipulated. And the last thing I wanted to do, let me, uh, let me pull up this. All right, we'll pull up this YouTube video. Go to YouTube. Let's look at these guys. So, Bakersfield uh, Urgent Care Doctors. All right, so I want to read some of the comments. Um, on the, these, this YouTube video. Pulse that there. It's, 
kind of a shame, right? The whole, but let's just read them before I say anything. It says, honest doctors, thank you. A huge thank you for this important discussion. Bravo. Um, yeah, okay, that's, that's okay. The, these people feel that the doctors are being honest. I can't, you can't blame somebody for that because again, it's this, you're not an expert in the field. You don't know who to trust, right? You don't know who's telling the truth. Um, I, I do, because I'm a doctor, but you start arguing about the pros and cons of um, building a, a wall to prevent um, floods in, in, I don't know, the eastern coast of the United States due to rising sea levels. I'd be like, um, I don't know about that. I have no idea. I literally don't know. Or you talk about different farming techniques and whether um, sustainable farming should be funded by X amount. I'm trying to come up, basically I'm giving examples of fields I know nothing about. There's a lawnmower in the background. But I know about medicine. I don't know, I'm not an expert on, uh, you know, the, the environment. I'm not an expert on the economy. I'm not an expert on space travel. And so I have some points I can bring up, but it, it, it takes a deep understanding of the not only the specifics, but the general issues behind in an industry and in a subject. And it takes years and years of study to really grasp those things. I didn't know, I didn't have a full grasp of medicine until after med school, years after med school and residency. And even then, I mean, you're talking about seven, eight, nine, ten years of study to get the big picture. Um, I get how it's tough as a consumer to know who to trust. So you can't blame these comments. Honest doctors, thank you. Yeah, I probably would think the same thing. If I watched an article about um, rising sea levels and building a, a sea level wall. So, um, you keep going though. Here's here's the, the real issue. Some of the people in attendance want to argue with the truth. Who are these people? Well, um, yeah, that's just a shame. This, this person, their comment, they kind of assume there's a conspiracy, right? That there's like, and here I am telling you almost two different things, right? I'm telling you to doubt the media. And I'm, these guys are implying that the media has this like bias and the media does have a bias so it is tough I know it's tough it's hard to know who to trust um, let's see what else Some, something else going on here the medical opinion based on facts um, I agree with everything they said here's something to ponder we are telling people who are healthy to stay at home indefinitely, but healthcare workers who test positive are returning to work in vulnerable communities. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. This is being taken down by YouTube. Um, honest physicians, they should be a White House task force. The original was removed. That's censorship. Share as much as you can. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's tough. How do you, how do you compete with disinformation? I don't know the right answer. Um, I really don't. It, it's a, it's a difficult question. Who do you know who to trust as a consumer? I don't know. Um, but I do know that if you can, can look at the way somebody argues and you can kind of see their points and see how they're making their points, it gives you power. Um, knowing argumentation techniques, knowing informal logical fallacies, look up a list of informal logical fallacies. Uh, it's really good reading and some of them are quite interesting, right? We talked about um, an appeal to authority, an appeal to emotion, um, uh, argument at repetition which is them saying, many cases, few deaths. They said that eight times, right? These are just three of the informal logical fallacies that they used. Um, yeah, 
to look up in formological fallacies, ponder, and I wish you all the very best. I hope you got a lot out of this video. Um, feel free to follow me on, on Medical Cases Podcast. And if you have any questions, uh, just ask. These are really interesting times. For now, wash your hands, wear a mask, and uh, try to help each other and support each other. Wish you all the very best.